All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the gospel twice. The first time, I'm going to share it uh, how I learned it, how I came to Christ, how I preached it a lot with an anointing and saw many people to come to Christ. And, uh, and it's based in a model that we would call a legal model. And in a legal model, what you have is sin as a law-breaking behavior that needs to be punished by a judge. And the gospel then in that model is how Jesus comes along and he's punished instead of us. But if you don't receive him, you get punished. But there must be punishment. And God in that model is really a judge. The second version I'm going to show you, it's much more of a therapeutic model or a healing model or a, a hospital model. So instead of a courtroom, um, if we were to use a metaphor, it would be more like a hospital where sin is a fatal disease that kills everybody. And you can't punish a disease out of someone. You can't spank a flu out of a, out of a baby. And you can't jail someone until their HIV goes away. It doesn't work that way far more serious than law-breaking behavior. What we need then is not a punishing judge, but a great physician who's able to heal us of our sin, who's able to heal us in our hearts, who's able to restore us completely. Now, um, I also will say this very quickly. I'm not just going to go from one metaphor to the next. I'm going to just sort of pass through the first one quickly. and, I, and and then move into the actual story. Why are we telling metaphors all the time? Trust the story. The gospel is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, um, and, and when we rush to transpose that into helpful metaphors, you can actually forget the story. You can forget the gospel. In my Orthodox church where I go, the gospel is a big book containing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the gospel. And so uh, hopefully you'll see in the second telling that it's loaded with that. All right, here we go. First version, legal model. In the beginning, God creates man. Adam and Eve puts them in the garden to represent his image and likeness in the world, to steward his creation, and to walk in perfect face-to-face -face fellowship with him. But in this model, a terrible thing happens, and we read about it in the Bible, the unthinkable. Adam and Eve sin, and in sinning, they become sinners. They turn from God, and because God is too holy, righteous, and just to look on sin, he needs to exile them from the garden. And so they go off into the world, and the world is now condemned under a curse that they introduced through their sin. And you know, it doesn't matter what we try to do in terms of self-righteous and religion. We've heard it many times. All your righteousness is filthy rags, and there is none righteous, no, not one, and so on. And uh, you know, even when God would turn and try to establish covenants with the people of God, what do they do? They're always turning from him. And because God is holy, righteous, and just, covenant is broken, and there's alienation. And this goes on and on. Whenever God comes and tries to establish a covenant like with Abraham or Moses or David, they're always up to some shenanigans, right? Abraham goes off and he's going to have his miracle child but with the sex slave. And he turns his back and God can't look on that kind of iniquity. Ah, but he comes to Moses and it's like, we're going to go rescue the people of God out of Egypt. And Moses in his flesh goes off and he starts on his own and he kills an Egyptian off into the desert, alienated from God. And then you've got David. Well, what's the deal with David? He's going to be the king who's on the throne of David. Out of him will come a Messiah, but the guy likes hot tubs. <laughs> and so, covenant is broken. This happens again and again. Finally, God responds and he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son into the world. He will be the second Adam. He will be what Adam never could be. He will represent my image and likeness in the earth. He will be perfectly righteous. He will always obey me and be in perfect fellowship with me. And he is. It's so amazing. But then the unthinkable happens again. Jesus Christ is crucified. And what we would preach in my earlier version of the gospel, my evangelical gospel, my grown-up Baptist in Manitoba gospel, 
is that God put all the sins of the world on this Jesus, all the guilt and all the iniquity and all the curse from humankind for all time. And in doing so, Jesus becomes a curse and he becomes sin. And then what do we read? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What? God forsakes his son? Yes, because God is holy, righteous, and just. He cannot look on sin. And he turns his back on his own son. And then he pours out all the wrath of God against sin onto his son and punishes him to the uttermost what all humankind should have been punished together. Thanks be to God, uh, Jesus did not sin, so Father raises him from the dead, and if you believe that Jesus did this for you, if you believe he died instead of you, took God's punishment for sin instead of you, then you will inherit eternal life. But if you don't believe that, God is still too holy, righteous, and just to look on sin. If you're not covered and clothed with the righteousness of Christ through faith in him, you'll continue in your alienation and sin. And if you should end your life this way, that will become permanent, and the eternal wrath of God will be poured out on you instead of Jesus. So there's an urgent plea. Therefore, turn to God. Repent. Come back to him so that he can show blessing and favor and bestow eternal life on you. And then, like, who doesn't want that? Well, lots of people, actually. You would think everybody would want that. <laughs> you would think that if you're dangling over the flames of hell like a spider, and someone comes along and says, I will go into hell for you so you don't have to go into hell, come over. What, why doesn't that always work? In fact, sometimes it has, but in our era, in this city, I am telling you, it creates atheists because you don't want to know a God like that. Why not? Well, here's the three tweaks that I think or, uh, need to happen, the three issues that I, that I see. Number one, does it, it seem to you like perhaps salvation is up to us? I sin, and so God turns away. How am I saved? Who saves me? I do. By turning to him so that he can turn to me. It's like I, the whole thing is now in my hands. If I turn away, he turns away. And he doesn't turn to me unless I turn to him. And uh, I just don't seem to see that in parables like the lost sheep that is down in the ditch, tangled in his own addictions, in its own pride, and it's, you know, we're talking humanly now. What does the good shepherd do? He goes down into the ditch. There's a grace thing happening, and, and I love the phrase in that parable, until he finds it. Until he finds it. This, it the perpetual quest of God for us. The prodigal son can kind of look like uh, you know, well, he, he doesn't get to enjoy eternal life till he comes home, and, we, and we'll run with that, but it seems very heavily on us in a way that doesn't seem like grace. It seems very conditional. My salvation's up to me. I mean, there's an available thing, but, but I, in or out is my, my call. That feels like it needs tweaking. Second, it pits, it pits God against people. This idea that God is too holy, righteous, and just to look on sin. Where did we ever get that idea? Let me tell you. Half a verse in Habakkuk. Where Habakkuk complains to the Lord. He says, your eyes, O Lord, are pure. And they cannot look on sin. So we made a whole theology of it. If only we'd read the second half of the verse. Which, if I could just summarize it, says this. So why do you? <laughs> Your eyes are too holy. You're too just. You cannot look on sin. So why do you? Why do you tolerate it? Why do you? And, and uh, so... Uh, and then God says, no, you're right, I do, actually, and I'm going to do something about sin, and I'm going to restore through a Messiah that I'm going to send. I will fix this. 
In fact, uh, I think it's Isaiah 59 is another one where, where we read at the beginning of the chapter, your sins have cut you off from God. But we got to keep reading. And when we keep reading, do you know what we find? God says, I'm not pleased about this, so I'm going to roll up my sleeve and stretch out my own right arm. That right arm of God is the Messiah. And he says, the Messiah is going to come and save you. And I will take the initiative. And then he says, and my spirit will never leave you. So there's a promise that, in fact, he won't abandon us, even though there's been this thing about alienation and being cut off. I just... Uh, uh, I think probably those who believe that God can't look on sin have forgotten something about Jesus Christ. He's God! <laughs> Did you notice he walked around sinners and ate with sinners and touched sinners and talked to sinners and it's like he was holy, righteous, and just. Holy love, righteous love, just love, which means out there to restore all things. I'm just like so, so excited about the fact that God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. And he could look a sinner in the eyes and be quite in love, thank you. You know? And so, we've got this, uh, this issue about God turning from us, and uh, in, in some theologians put it this way, one of the older theologians had said uh, that, that you are now, because of the righteousness of Christ, God clothes you with Christ so he can look on you. He kind of hides you in Jesus, and you are snow-covered dung. <laughs> You're still poo! <laughs> but it's okay, because Jesus has tricked God by hiding you in a cloak of righteousness, right? Um, a, a living theologian actually put it this way. Jesus is your asbestos suit from the white hot wrath of God, right? And so it's like Jesus gets between you and God as if, as if Jesus needs to save you from God. Where, whereas I've already said it, God was in Christ. Jesus was fully God and fully man at all times, which leads us to our third issue. That model actually pits God against Jesus at some point on Good Friday. Where did we get the idea that God turned his face from Jesus? Well, from some of our hymns and from Psalm 22, verse 1, that Jesus is quoting when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, though, you've got to read on because you see, Psalm 22 is an entire chapter on uh, the passion of the Christ. It's really detailed. It tells you specifically they pierced his hands and his feet. They divided his garments with lots. It speaks of Jesus' death, of his de this cry of dereliction, where are you? And it speaks of an answer. So if we keep reading, here's what it says. Down, you get to verse 22. Prophetically, putting these words in Jesus' mouth. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you who descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Why? For he has not despised and scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And then the Lord Jesus says, Ah, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. All right, with those three things in mind, that I'm resisting the idea that we have to turn to make this happen, that God was ever pitted against humankind, or that the Father was ever holding the spear on Good Friday. Let's go to the second telling. It starts out the same. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, put them in the garden to steward the world and to image him in the world and to fellowship with him in the garden. The unthinkable happens. Adam and Eve sin, and in sinning, they experience death. And what does God do? He comes looking for them. What are you wearing on your genitals there? <laughs> That's like fi fig leaves. It's like, why, why are you wearing fig leaves? Well, we're naked. Who told you you're naked? <gasps> well, this shame thing. He did it. She did it. It did it. And so God, in his kindness, sends them from the garden to protect them from eating of the tree of life and being permanently stuck in the curse of death. 
And he goes with them. And he clothes them, gives them garments. They have kids. Cain's one of the kids. What's Cain doing? Planning to plot his, bro his, he's, he's plotting his brother's death. What does God do? Comes looking. Cain, what are you doing? Nothing. Sin's crouching at your door. It is going to eat you up. Don't do it. He does it. What does God do? Comes looking for Cain. Cain, where's your brother? Don't know. None of my business, is it? It's like, you do know. And uh, in the end, he ends, he ends up going east of Eden and establishes civilization upon a foundation of murder. And what does God do? He gives him a patriarchal mark to protect him so that no one can take vengeance on him. This happens again and again. You know, you've got Abraham with the sex slave. What does God do? He gives him his miracle child anyway, and he blesses the slave and her son. Moses goes off, kills the Egyptian, ends up in the wilderness. God shows up in a shrubbery. Hey, flame on, this thing's still happening. Let's go get our people, right? <laughs> David off to the hot tub with Bathsheba. What does God do? From Bathsheba, he gives David a child from whom our Messiah comes, King Solomon. You get to the prophets, you know, it's crazy. Hosea is like, uh, the people of God have been wicked. They harm everyone. They're unjust. They destroy one another. They destroy the earth. They abuse people. They should be punished. And God says, ah, I can't do it. My heart is turned within me. I started remembering them in the high chair. They were so cute. <laughs> remembering their first steps. Remembering, he says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to destroy them. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send them prophets with such a beautiful gospel before they re repent so that their hearts will be drawn to me. So even Old Testament, don't worry about the God of the Old Testament. He was in pursuit like a rabid lover. I don't know. Can, that's a really bad mixed <laughs> metaphor. All right. So we get to, let's go to the New Testament. Um, we've got, we've got, a, uh, here's a man who has short man syndrome and he, he, he's like really into compensating somehow by like stealing money from his own people as a tax collector. He's not only a collaborator with Rome, a betrayer of his own nation, he's even pocketing stuff on top of that for himself and everyone knows that he's lost his family, he's lost his reputation, he's lost his his faith community, everybody hates him. And what does God do? He walks under a tree one day. Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'll be your friend. And he goes and has dinner with him, and you, he declares him clean by eating with him. And Zacchaeus is so touched by the kindness of Jesus that he, he, uh, that, that he gives the money back with interest and the rest, half of it, to the poor. Here's a woman who's had a marriage and a divorce, no, two divorces, no, three divorces, no, four divorces, no, come on, five divorces, and now the man she's with isn't her husband, and what does God do? He sits down with her at the well, and he says, I know your problem, you're thirsty, and I can help you with that. I can put a fountain of living water in you such that it will rise, spring up and you will never be thirsty again. And she becomes one of the great evangelists, Saint Fatina, equal to the apostles, the first evangelist to the Samaritans. Her and her sons were martyred. She was killed by being thrown down a well. You know why? Because she was probably sharing about this Jesus and that encounter. Here's a man who, the cur through the curse that's gone randomly through our earth, is now a paraplegic, maybe a quadriplegic. And everybody knows that that means God cursed you in the ancient world. That's what it meant. God did everything. If something bad happened, God did it. And because God is righteous, you must have sinned, and therefore, you're being punished. All disabled people were under the curse of God. But what does God say? Well, first of all, God starts <laughs> wiping some plaster out of his hair as the roof's coming open, and four friends drop the guy down because they heard rumors of a more beautiful gospel. 
And, and uh, Jesus says, well, let's just take this off the table first. Your sins are forgiven. Oh, it's like, anyone could say, say that. It's like, yeah, but can anyone do this? Take up your mat and walk. Bam, the guy stretches out and he's healed and he's walking. He's like, oh my goodness. Maybe, like in John 9, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Maybe just stuff happens. And we need a good, great, wonderful physician. Here's a woman who's been caught in adultery, dragged to the temple. She's going to be stoned. Where's the man? Could I even say this? Where the hell is the man? <laughs> this, is a, this, this is a setup. She has been set up in order to set Jesus up. And what does God do? Is he too holy, righteous, and just? Is he so law-keeping he picks up a stone? No, he kneels in the dust beside her and he starts scribbling until one by one everyone leaves. All the accusers are gone, youngest to oldest. The oldest get it. We have a track record, right? And so... He says, where are your cruisers? They're gone, my Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, as a little Baptist boy, I heard it this way. And I don't want to be hard on the Baptist. It's just as a little Baptist boy, I heard it this way. <laughs> Go and sin no more. <laughs> and what I think Jesus is saying is, I am going to wash you clean Today never even happened, according to God's records. You get a fresh start. You don't have to go back to that guy. You, what are you going to do with your life? She's like, I'll follow you. That's what I'll do. Here's a man who's lost his mind. He's so full of demons that when people try to chain him up, he breaks the chains, and now he's living in the tombs. He's torn off his clothes. He's completely lost it and demonized by a whole legion. What does God do? He gets in a boat and he crosses Galilee. And his, when his foot lands on the, the, the sands of Decapolis, all the demons in the region shake in their boots. Because Jesus, God in the flesh, restores the man's sanity, restores the man his dignity, his clothes, his people. And, and then when the man says, ah, I can talk again. I want to follow you, Jesus. Says, no, don't do that. Just go tell people the beautiful gospel. Here is a woman who came to Freshwind Christian Fellowship, a church that we planted. A lot of disabled folks, a lot of people with disabilities. She was an addict. She hadn't been able to stay sober for 100 days since the time she was 13 or 14 years old. She would hide vodka all over her house. Even through her pregnancy, she, she could not get clean at all. So she's on the run. She actually was sort of trapped in a, in, in a drug house and couldn't get out. And what did God do? He went and got her out of that drug house, and he gave her a good husband, and then he brought her to our church, and then she became one of our intercessors, and she became very good at doing inner healing ministries with people. And, and then, and then she fell off the wagon. And she took about $10,000 of her husband's money, or their money, and disappeared into the streets. And she was living at times in a cardboard box, at times in a pickup truck. And she was seriously losing her mind. She developed, uh, through needle use, developed um, um, hepatitis. And then... And then, uh, what does God do? Through her now ex-husband, the ex-husband contacts her and he says, um, I want you and your boyfriend to come live with me and I'm going to put you both through detox. And for two weeks, he puts them through detox, then he puts them in a recovery house. Uh, each uh, male recovery house, female recovery house, and she's in, she's in there and she has a talk with Jesus. And she says, I'm just so sorry. I threw away my husband. I threw away my children. I threw away my health. I threw away my faith. And I don't even want you to do something for me. I just want you to know I'm so, so sorry. And what does God do? He picks up, in, she has a vision of him picking up her needle kit, tying off his arm and injecting her heroin into his arm. And she says, no, you can't do that. He's too holy, righteous, and just to do that, right? 
And he says, actually, isn't this what I've done for every man, woman, and child on this planet? I have taken the curse and the sin and the, and the pain of this world into myself, and I've swallowed it in love. This is the cross. In that moment, her, her, she was cured. Now, we don't normally t talk about cure with addictions, but I'm telling you, she hasn't had a craving since in 20 years. 15 years, 15 years. And, uh, oh, it gets crazier. She goes to have her first interferon treatment and they cancel it because they can't find any hepatitis in her body. And then, and then she, she, uh, she calls her ex-husband and says, I wanna get married, would you walk me down the aisle? This is Hosea stuff now. And he does it. After a year together with her new husband, the ex-husband says, I, you need more time with the kids. I want to invite you and your new husband to come and live in my basement suite and we'll raise the kids together. Eventually, he sold his half of the house to them. She went back and got her MA in counseling and today she's a family, family therapist for Jesus who's just changing the world. And her new husband is, is a landscaper who only hires addicts to walk them through recovery. This is what our God can do. Well, we're gonna just come to this part now. Eventually, humankind turned its back on Jesus and we murdered him. And what did God do? He stretched out his hands on that cross in welcome and he said, Father, forgive them. I forgive you. And the most amazing thing uh, is, is is now that he's invited us to participate in his divinity, the way, by grace, the way he participated in our humanity. And you know, there'll be some who still run from him and he just runs after them. And there's some who run a lot and he runs a lot after them. And I don't know if you've experienced this. I was told if you run from God, it'll be hard to hear him. Not my experience. He's like, hi, what you doing? I'm like, could I have 20 minutes? I don't think so, son. Right? And then, and then finally, I mean, you could, run, you could run right into the grave. And what did God do? He descended into Hades. And he preached good news to all who are in the grave. And then, and then he ro rose from the dead and he says this, I was dead, but now behold, I'm alive and I hold the keys of death in Hades. Think about this. If Jesus holds the keys of death in Hades, what do you think he'll do with them? And all those who are in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of God and they will rise. He does say, some to life and some to judgment. Here's what it's like though. Now, there's nowhere in the universe where Jesus is not. There are those who perhaps in this life and even into the next life will still want to resist the love of God. Do you think he'll ever give up? No. What, his mercy endures forever. How long? How long? Forever. His mercy endures forever and his loving kindness is ever lasting. And maybe, maybe for all eternity you could run from, probably not, but we know this is impossible that his mercy will ever run out. That his loving kindness could ever have a time limit or some kind of clock dangling over you. So we preach this gospel and we say, he is so after you. He loves you so much, and, and he even loves you enough to let you run away. But what he won't do is let you run away. <laughs> he's the hound of heaven, and he's after you, and if, if you love love, it will feel like heaven, and maybe if you hate love, it will feel like hell. But what you will always forever be confronted with is the never-ending love of God. I think we should stop there. Come on out, kid.